I'm uh, uh, Jim Kelly. I'm from Brooklyn, so that gives me a certain amount of uh, credibility. <laughs> so, uh, oh, boo. I've had Brooklyn pizza. Right. Now, uh, I confess to being uh, a sociologist. I'll try to explain uh, how I became identified with doing uh, research uh, for pro-life uh, consistent uh, ethics. Personally, it, it, it says a whole lot uh, about sociology and I guess about uh, our higher cultural life that uh, while I had thoughts and read about uh, uh, the abortion issue, it wasn't until I got tenure that I thought uh, uh, it wouldn't be uh, too risky for me and my career and my family to actually do pro-life uh, research. So I'm Even not... Uh, pardon me? Even at Fordham? Well, Fordham was different, but you wanted to, at Fordham, you, you had to, to get any increase, you had to publish in journals that were not oh, Fordham-centered or Catholic, they had to be, so they had to be uh, objective. See Nat Hentoff for what happens when you become publicly known in terms of some empathy uh, for the uh, sociological study of right to life people. And my first article, I must admit, was uh, I just used this. No, I, I wanted to be objective and follow sociological uh, protocol. So I did what I, I got from the phone book, the names of people identified with uh, right to life causes. And then I used the snowball effect. I would just say, tell me other people, tell me other people. So I tried to be as objective as possible. And what I found out contradicted all the uh, stereotypes of right to life uh, people. And in fact, the first article I wrote was towards complexity, uh, understanding the opposition to uh, abortion. So now, I'm really, uh, we have here a champion, I think, uh, a, 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 someone who considers racial uh, a champion, and so do I. Because when I sent uh, racial my paper, I said what I wanted to do was do a sociological account of the opposition to abortion and do it in a way that would fit a sociology uh, textbook. And uh, I gave it to uh, Rachel, and then Rachel said, uh, Jim, uh, I think we have to edit this, and I'm going to make it more readable. So what... Uh, uh, Rachel did was take my remarks and synthesize them into, uh, oh, I'd say about four or five uh, minutes. Uh, <laughs> and, and I'm going to end with that because one of the things I did learn, many things I learned at our gathering, and, and one of them is uh, the, the, the people who have the least credibility on this issue are 70 year old males. So, <laughs> I want to identify as closely as possible <laughs> to racial, my heroine uh, as well. And I want to just give a little bit of, uh, of sociology, and I think it, I can make it uh, meaningful for you in terms of how you personally deal with this uh, issue and talk uh, with others. And if you're at all interested in, in a fuller development, uh, please pick up this free <laughs> paper, and I'd love to hear from you. Uh, but, but first, just this, this word here, teleological. It's in the dictionary. I think it has an enormous amount uh, of wisdom for us in terms of how we think about this issue and how we conduct ourselves uh, in it. Uh, let me uh, begin before I do the sociology translation, uh, with a little poetry. <laughs> this is from T.S. Eliot, The Four Quartets, 1944. He says, and the end and the beginning were always there. What we call the beginning is often the end. And to make an end is to make a beginning. Now that's poetry. He, Here's the sociological translation, which I get from one of my uh, professors. His name is Charles Tilley. And this is how 
he talks about uh, uses te teleology. So th this is an objective sociologist, and it will remind you of uh, Eliot. Though we tell them forward, say what's happening now, uh, as Rachel's going to say, thirty years would would tell them from the beginning to the end. The logic, the logic of social movements runs backwards from the present state of affair to their prehistory. Social movements involve a subtle teleology which imputes a kind of coherence and self-propulsion. So in other words, you can only see the logic and the motivation if you look at the end their formal cause. I mean, telos is a, is a Greek word from uh, Aristotle, and what telos means is the formal cause, the, the final end, is, is, is distinct from efficient causality. So what's the purpose here? So in a way, teleology is what's the ultimate uh, purpose? So we know that uh, anti-abortion is not the... Uh, what the movement stands for, and we know that uh, pro-life, that gets it closer, and consistent ethic, but I'm going to say consistent ethic isn't the telos of our movement, that our movement has a different telos, and the, and the telos will be uh, nonviolence and pacifism, and to do that we have to overcome our reliance on the just war theory. As we have a telos, so does the uh, right to choose, or free choice. And their telos is gender justice. And we have to relate those two telos's. And the way we relate those telos's is common ground. Now, I just want to uh, pause for uh, a second. I'll, I'll give some concrete examples and try to make it a little bit uh, uh, more tactile. But, by the way, in, t in terms of the uh, uh, telos, that means movements are constantly going through frame realignments. In other words, they have to change the terms that they're using just to seem credible to people objective people on the outside. Before we get to do our frame uh, realignments, which I define better in this uh, paper, uh, the cardinal virtues are key. So uh, let me just pause on, on that, the, the, the cardinal virtues. I think everybody in every social movement should read the cardinal virtues. The, the standard volume is uh, Joseph Pieper came out in 1944. And, yeah, and, oh, you're so right, you're so right. And, and so what Pieper says that there's a whole lot of things that go into the good life and, and virtuous activity, but there's four things that are cardinal. Without them, you can't, you can't do anything that makes a worthy life. And the fourth one, so that's... And, is the least important, but central, he calls temperance or self-control. Unless there's some self-discipline, no matter what we do, uh, it's not going to work out. And then the third is uh, fortitude or bravery. Unless we have a certain amount of bravery, we're not going to do what we think we are called to do. Uh, but just being brave ain't enough. Why? Because you could be a brave jerk. You could do stupid things. And then, of course, the whole point of it is uh, justice. Uh, justice for human beings. That's the whole point of, of courage. But to achieve justice, you need, and this is, this is why it's the primary of all the primary virtues, you need uh, prudence. Because what prudence does is says, in all of this complexity, the booming, buzzing complexity, what's the best way to proceed to do the most good in terms of all of the hazards and the difficulties? So a lot of the 
the, the issues uh, among social movement uh, participants, social movement organizations is the technical sociological uh, term, it comes down to questions of uh, prudence. How, how do you best achieve the most good in this particular concrete, complex uh, uh, situation? I want to give you uh, a, an example of uh, the telos of the movement, what's at the end is, is really present, although in a nascent or latent form, uh, even at the uh, uh, very beginning. So this is uh, number six in this big paper I have here, which has uh, uh, eight different uh, points. And this is anticipating telos, uh, colon, already inclusively nonviolent when defensively answering uh, critics. Now, as we all know, uh, about 1992, uh, very soon uh, after the Supreme Court, uh, Casey versus Southwestern Pennsylvania, there was a whole lot of clinic violence. And, uh, during that period, uh, eight abortion doctors were killed. And also, there was a lot of damage and burnings and arsons. Uh, the data is in here. But a supreme embarrassment to the, uh, to the movement and even to the mainstream uh, national right to life uh, uh, movement. Now, I found it uh, most interesting, if you go back, so... How did all of these mainstream people, by this time, they're no longer, they're, 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 they're not open to the uh, Democratic Party, they're not open to uh, uh, common ground, they're, they're aligned with the, the Republicans. Uh, how do these leaders now, under the catalyst of saying, well, what do you say, because the press is after them, what do you say about uh, these uh, Dr. Killings? And now in terms of the telos of the pro-life movement, it should be noticed that from the very start, after each murder of an abortion-performing doctor or the injury of abortion workers or bystanders, the Right to Life social movement organizations unfailingly characterize their movement as inherently nonviolent. The telos is affecting them. I'll, I'll give you examples. I don't make this up. Indeed, they typically sound like pacifists. For example, after the Eric Rudolph series of terrorist bombings in the Atlanta area in the mid-1960s, the executive director of Georgia Right to Life said that violence is never the solution to social problems. Never. Gary Bauer, president of the Family Research Council, said violence is not the answer to violence. These are mainstream guys who, by this time, are pretty much what we call a rock of, uh, 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 a Reagan Democrats. You know, they might have been Democrats in the beginning, but now they identify with the Republican uh, Party. David Osteen, long-term director of the National Right to Life Committee, said, the goal of the National Right to Life Committee, get this, is to break the cycle of violence, which includes abortion, not perpetuating. Now, if, if you, I, I don't think anybody in the consistent life movement would go to the National Right to Life news, uh, news or, or records and think that they're going to get congruent statements that show that the whole point uh, of opposition to uh, abortion is looking at the killing of babies as part of a larger cycle of violence. I actually remember reading, I don't know if you know the study, in the National Right to Life News uh, in the late 80s or early 90s, that someone did a study and posed members of the National Right to Life Committee in NARA the same questions that were asked on a Gallup poll and found out that the members of um, NLC were actually more to the left than the nation as a whole. 
on issues of militarism and the economy. Yes. And that was in, it was just given like a line, but it was actually in the National Right to Life. Yes. I don't know if you're familiar with the study. I am. It's a sociological study. And I, I quote it. But how many people would know that? I think very uh, few now, because they would look at it, they would frame it just now that to be uh, really uh, a successful opponent of abortion, you have to you give up on the Democrats and you go for the Republicans. And, and by the way, the, uh, the opening for the Democrats for Life, again, uh, that's, I think, uh, the cardinal virtues, Fudos, uh, applied really there, too. I mean, the whole notion of seeking common ground, I think, uh, in terms of in involving uh, your opponents, those who, who support uh, legal uh, abortion, uh, but you know that now they've had the, the pro-choice now is the reproductive health movement, where their frame realignment is to make sure that women who clearly desire an abortion get it, but that they're not forced into it because of questions of poverty and questions of no support. Uh, so there's that common ground that's possible with the virtue of, uh, of, of prudence. It's evident that when challenged to questions raised by, the, usually sociologists honestly call the, the murder of abortion doctors uh, lone wolves, you know, that because empirically they're not really that involved with, but so they act pretty much uh, on, on their own. Uh, pro life leaders, uh, it, it, when challenged to respond, saying that maybe what you're saying still encourages such people, they sound like Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Dorothy Day, and countless others. Although still mostly latent in the larger movement and surfacing during social movement organizations confronting crises of moral credibility, the core of the movement opposing abortion rests on a principled nonviolence that separates itself from just war theory. Indeed, because abortion doctor murders and their supporters have commonly employed just war theory to justify those killings. In other words, when the, uh, and, and you can read this if, if you're interested, and a very important issue of uh, First Things, uh, founded by the late uh, Richard John Newhouse, they sponsored a December 1994 symposium entitled Killing Abortionists. And what's in it, they were against it, of course. But what's interesting, in all the letters to the editor and the complaints, it was because that they had it under just war theory stopping this abortion doctor from uh, doing more killing is justifiable under just war criteria. Uh, so I found that in, in, in other, here, for example, uh, here's an analogy. If the abortionist had been on his way, oozy in hand, to murder all the children in a given school building, all the parents in town would have surrounded that school with whatever weapon they could lay their hands on. So that abortion doctor killer is not guilty of any crime punishable by uh, law. The Reverend Michael Womack thought appeals to the applications of just war theory were very convincing. The origins of the modern pro-legal abortion do not lie in feminism. In her 1963 classic, The Feminist Critique, Betty Friedan does not even mention abortion, much less consider it a necessity for women's equality. So how does it come to frame, how does feminism come to reframe itself so that abortion becomes uh, an essential core part of it? Well, the late historian Mary Crane Durr has documented, and I think we know this, that early 18th and 19th century suffragists writing regularly referred to abortion as anti-natal anti murder and even as infanticide 
and uh, in a speech Susan B. Anthony included abortion as one of the evils perpetrated by men against women. And in one of the, uh, the revolution, her newspaper said, we must, we want prevention, not just punishment. Uh, we want to, we must reach the root of the evil and destroy it. So, so if not feminism, what was the contemporary start of the movement to legalize abortion? And how did they frame their argument? The first organized support for legalizing abortion came from the eugenics and population control organizations. In 1922, the American Eugenics Society first founded and by, uh, was founded, and by 1931, 27 states enacted sterilization laws to remove those unfit to reproduce. So we had eugenic uh, sterilization uh, way before the Germans. Paul Ehrlich's 1965 bestseller was entitled The Population Bomb, a commitment to zero population growth necessitated support for legal abortion. You want to save the planet, you got to have abortion. The first prominent call for not reform, you know, little incremental changes, but for the utter repeal of abortion laws was Lawrence Later, who titled his 1971 book, Breeding Ourselves to Death. Lawrence Later was co-founder of the National Association for the Repeal of Abortion Laws. So that's their original uh, framing, uh, eugenics. And it was Later who, present, who persuaded Betty Friedan that the newly formed National Organization for Women should oppose, should endorse abortion. So it wasn't given, it was later from this eugenics movement uh, background. This provoked considerable conflict within the National Organization for Women. There was no referendum on it, and many delegates resigned. And four years later, some chapters unsuccessfully tried to remove abortion from NOW's Bill of Rights for Women. They failed. because they, they found that the connection with abortion impeded their work on other crucial women's issues, such as daycare, medical insurance, neighborhood schools. What year was that? This is 1971. All, all of the data is here. <laughs> Make it less for me to carry home. <laughs> The most prominent and mainstream of abortion of opposition social movement organization, as we know, is the National Right to Life Committee, with membership in all states. In the September 1974 edition of its National Right to Life News, editor Janet Grant characterized legal abortion activists as upper class elites. The right to life, the, the, the rich, she editorialized, want to share abortion with the poor. But sharing stops when it comes to wealth clubs and neighborhoods. In that same issue, Donna Sullivan asked, are social pressures now geared more to getting rid of poor babies than assisting their mothers with economic problems? The issue of what? What, what, what journalist is this? This is the National Right to Life News. Oh, oh okay. So, which, which most people would say this is the mainstream uh, place where you look for what abortion op opponents are saying. Mm -hmm. Not fringe, central, but they're saying <laughs> radical things in mm -hmm. terms of economic priorities. Mm -hmm. The March 1974 edition of National Right to Life News found it ironic that some congressmen were arguing that abortion lowered welfare costs when Congress had spent billions to wage a war in Indochina. How did the Democrats lose these folks? How did that happen? I try to answer it. <laughs> these right to life feminists are not just anecdotal exceptions. Here's your point. 
Sociologist Granberg's 1978 Pro-Life or Reflections of Conservative Ideology question studied both right to life and uh, national abortion uh, and narrow. And he expressed surprise by the clash between the empirical data he obtained and his pre-research expectations. Here's an objective sociologist. Granberg found that 56% of national right to life leaders opposed capital punishment, as contrasted to only 28% of all American adults. 71% disagreed with the idea that the United States should be ready and willing to use military force if necessary to assure our access to important resources, such as oil, which are necessary to our way of life. Later studies showed that while pro-choice respondents scored high on liberal rights issues, such as opposition to censorship and sex education, they scored lower than abortion opponents on economic liberal items that asked about government spending on social programs such as housing and food stamps. In other words, social conservatives are very distinct from fiscal conservatives. The Republicans are fiscal conservatives and most uh, people opposing abortion are social conservatives. They don't fit. That's an unstable con connection. While it now appears predictable that committed legal abortion opponents find their political home in the Republican Party and legal abortion advocates in the Democratic Party, the historical fact is the exact opposite. Democrats for Life, despite what it says on its home page, was not founded in 1997. That's when it was refounded. Democrats for Life go back to 1967, and they were honored by the uh, National Pro-Life Committee. Data is here. Most, the dramatic example of Ellen McCormick. She's a housewife leader of the Long Island New York Women for the Unborn, who knowingly quixotic, knowingly quixotic, succeeded in obtaining enough registered voters to place her name in the 1975 Democratic primaries in 20 states. She qualified for matching federal funds for her primary campaigns and was nominated for president at the 1976 Democratic National Convention. I don't think many people remember that. I, and I saw in the Wikipedia article when her uh, name was placed in nomination, she got 22 delegates yes. to vote for her. I mean, that's, that's extraordinary. I mean, she had, no, she, had no Demo she had no political experience before. She just was trying to knowingly quixotic bring abortion to the attention of the population. And in my personal interview with her, she said there was no possibility that she would uh, try to get nominated in the Republican Party because that's the party of big business and big profits. Uh, they're not going to interest themselves in saving uh, babies. Well, Reagan did succeed in having a Republican platform committee write in to promise the repeal of Roe. The way it proceeds remains highly illuminative uh, in her insider's account. This is Tanya Mellick, who... Uh, uh, again, this is a, a great source for, well, what happened in uh, 76, because by 1980, Ellen McCormick was no longer uh, welcome at the National Right to Life uh, Committee, and Bernie Bauer was no longer offered uh, a session and a special uh, table. Uh, and, he, and here's the inside account of what happened, because most of the delegates really did support pro-choice. So this inside account by Melick uh, says the, the vote on the Reagan amendment, the Reagan amendment was put in the Republican platform as uh, support for the repeal of Roe. So that was the first time. That was uh, 76. And Melick claims there were uh, sufficient pro-choice delegates to overturn the amendment. But the convention chairman John Rhodes, who is a Reagan ally, called for a voice, a voice vote and then simply declared a majority in favor of reversing Roe. 
What is far more certain is that the polls of these delegates showed the vast majority did not favor a road reverse. So, so the, even that vote by the Republican Party was a fix. Data is uh, in here. Uh, I'm, I'm going to skip uh, uh, about the, uh, the part uh, uh, about the appointment of a Supreme Court judge, uh, a guy who's in favor of uh, supporting uh, overturning a uh, row. Too complicated, I, I deal with it here. It's not going to make a whole lot of difference. So let me now just turn to the Democrats for life, because that's the key part of uh, prudence and keeping uh, and, and trying to get to release the uh, connection of abortion uh, from the Republican stranglehold. Democrats for life, and I, I, so I think it, it is going to be successful. But this is just a small, a very small, though necessary step in the ongoing efforts to grasp the ultimate meaning, the final meaning, the teleology of the opposition to abortion. The routine sociological media framing of abortion is that it's a conservative counter-movement. It's, it's against and it, it's rooted in the past. Few understand its core radicalism. Th that's why I titled this, uh, slowly getting to know the, the meaning of the opposition to abortion, how really radical it is, its core radicality. While in time, the disentanglement of abortion social movement organizations from the increasingly unrewarding political alliance with Republican fiscal conservatives and the movement's gradual turn to a consistent ethic of life will facilitate some incremental political linkages to a growing Democrats for life. This represents but a necessary step in a return to the movement's originating radical core that a resort to violence in any form is a negation of the human good. As no principle and no term, especially in its foreign affairs, is more alien to nation-state sovereignty than nonviolence. So incredibly radical, and we're just beginning to learn how radical our movement is and what that requires of us. So, Thank you, Rachel, for your patience. Now, I am going to start with the psychology of consistency, and this would have to do with the concept of cognitive dissonance. You may have learned about it in Psychology 101, and you may not have. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. But here's the basic idea. Back in the 1950s, um, there was a, a case of a woman who announced that um, the whole world was going to be destroyed um, by floods, but that uh, there was a set of people that there was going to be uh, an alien spaceship that you could escape to. And she had the date, and it was all set. And uh, so the people gathered in, the, now, mind you, People had sold their houses. People had given up their jobs. People that bought her story, she was, she was uh, getting uh, messages through writing that was, you know, dictated to her somehow. They had put themselves in a state where they were really going to be in trouble if it wasn't true. And they sit around all night uh, waiting for the alien spaceship, and nothing's happening. And nothing's happening. And there, the, the Miriam Keats, she starts saying, oh, I, I get the feeling you're, you're losing faith in me. And they're like, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so she, she uh, gets more messages, and she says, aha, you know what's happened? Because we got in this room and prayed so hard and spread so much light, the flooding has been canceled. <laughs> and uh, they said, that's it, that's it. We, we did it, we did it. We got the, cancel, uh, the flooding canceled, and so they went out and proselytized to everybody about how they got the flooding canceled and it wasn't that great. Now, uh, 
Schlesinger was looking at this and saying, um, okay, what, what is it that's causing that? Because, you know, rational observation would be that it was wrong and there never was going to be any flooding and that. I mean, basically, there was a hypothesis that was disconfirmed. Why? Yeah. And he, he came up with the, the theory of cognitive dissonance. And it's basically the idea that people want their actions, beliefs, and emotions to match. And a mismatch is stressful. That's the, the quick way of saying it. Um, the Machiavellian personality can just say, okay, inconsistent, what do you do? No, no big deal. But most people really do have a problem if there's a mismatch. And so what they'll do is they'll try to figure out why it isn't a mismatch. Now, you have the, the different uh, ideas or behaviors, and one way you can deal with it is by saying, oh, well, this one isn't all that important, or um, this one isn't true when it clearly is. Uh, you can get into some remarkable mental gymnastics, and I'm sure I need not provide examples to this group. I think probably several examples were popping into your mind as I said it. Like I said, this is 1950, so there have been like loads and loads of studies on this, and it's been very well developed. And if you really want more detail on how this applies, um, the book um, Achieving Peace in the Abortion War. Here's the problem that we have. In the 1970s, the first cognition is we Americans are a noble and virtuous people. Now, in the case of abortion, we have the uh, uh, cognition two, abortion numbers are rising. Now, the, the dynamic that I'm about to say, it's called the great switch, which is my own term. Don't, don't use it with other psychologists. I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, this can also apply with uh, uh, executions. Execution numbers are going down. This can actually apply even with war. War numbers. The, uh, much as we keep hearing about it in the news, if you look at charts, the wars are going down and the war deaths are going down. But, I mean, okay, what are we going to do? Because this one, this is self-esteem. And this one is a fact. And, I mean, it was a fact in the 1970s. Now, a lot of pro-lifers dealt with it by saying, okay, well, we Americans aren't terribly noble and virtuous then. And that's a very common way for peace movement people to deal with the point as well. Very, very common. Uh, is it really surprising that it doesn't really go over real well, you know, when you're trying to do education? That, that when you are trying to raise alarm about this, you've got to realize that you are challenging that. And as long as you're challenging that, you've got a roadblock. So, you make them consistent by saying, abortion must not be so bad. Mm -hmm. And that's why, at the point when the numbers were rising, we were having a really hard time convincing people who had been entirely convinced that abortion was a terrible thing 10 years earlier, it, it, it has to be. It has to be not so bad as long as the fact is that the numbers are going up. Now here's to the rescue. This I uh, pulled off the uh, web just this week. Um, this is the Alan, Alan Guttmacher Institute. There, uh, I mean, I just copied and pasted it straight, so the, the, the point about the historic low was what uh, Alan Guttmasser was saying. You see what happens in, uh, over here we have 1973, 75. The peak is right around uh, 1981, and then it's going down and down and down 
and through the Great Recession, it is going down and down and down. And it's now lower than it was in 73 uh, in terms of rate. The uh, rate is uh, uh, how many women per thousand. Uh, so, 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 um, so, you, you know, you're not saying, if you just did just numbers, you might get more abortions because you just have more young women, or you might get fewer abortions because you have fewer young women, and young women are the ones that get pregnant. Um, so that's why the rate is the, the standard. Rachel? Yeah? Even within the rate, there's a huge difference between a 15-year-old and a 44-year-old. And I wonder if maybe abortions are going down because the average age of fertile women is older. Well, there's you know, a I mean, the, right. The, the there's a would be much more likely to go to term for a number of reasons right. than a, than a 15 year old. And furthermore, even if she has an abortion, she's more likely to go to a private doctor where her abortion may not be included in the statistics. Okay. Uh, these are Alan Guttmacher statistics, which uh, tend to be the most uh, well, uh, robust. But you're right. You're right. You're right. But the, but but most of most of what's happening along here, you would have the the same dynamics going on in terms of of age and so forth. And uh, there are several reasons that people think that the rate is going down. One proposal, the Alan Guttmacher Institute, of course, thinks it's because Planned Parenthood is doing this fantastic job of uh, uh, pushing the contraception. And that's their theory. And then there are theories about what's happening with state legislation, and a good case can be made that state legislation is making it go down. Uh, David Reardon has proposed what he calls the little sister effect, which is similar to the little brother effect that they noted with the crack cocaine epidemic going down, that the little brother saw the big brother on crack cocaine and said, I'm not doing that. And so in the same way, little sister is seeing what happens to big sister who had an abortion and going, uh, yeah. Um, we have, right now, we have young people who have sonogram pictures of themselves when they were fetuses sitting on their refrigerator door. That makes a difference. I have talked to young people who have, who have said, yeah, my, my girlfriend got pregnant and her boyfriend was pushing her and this was terrible that her boy." People have more of a sense that abortion is something that men are pushing on women than they did back here. And remember, back here, a lot of it was EGADs, the back alley butchers. Over here, people are fully aware that uh, uh, abortion clinics, if, if they're not safe now, it's not because of illegality. It's because of the nature of abortion clinics. And then I will, uh, I'll, I'll give one other reason and then get to you. One other possibility, I think, is that we're dealing here with people who are responding to Massive, massive killing in Vietnam and incredible uh, nuclear weapons buildup. And Robert J. Lifton has proposed, he, he wasn't thinking about abortion specifically, but he was thinking about you know, divorce rates and people just not wanting to have kids because of the nuclear weapons. Now, there's no good way of testing that theory because obviously we can't uh, you know, run a control group on that one. But I think that w another possible uh, uh, theory that would work is that people are having, you know, our wars are smaller and more hidden now. It's not the same kind of nightly news thing as it was. And the nuclear weapons, while they're still there, they're way, way fewer than they used to be. And people don't have the same sense that we're in danger of that, and so there's less of a, a kind of despair about life. Um, and so those are several theories, and, and none of them can be uh, tested since there's no control group. Yeah. Do you think another reason might be because of the kind of rising immigration rate, so more women who wouldn't necessarily consider an abortion are in the United States? Um, that is 
that is an interesting one to look at. That would, that would definitely be an interesting one to look at. But it's also true that we just know from attitudes that younger people are less into uh, the idea than, uh, than people in my generation. And I think part of that, I mean, I, you know, when I was dealing with Division 48, which is Division of Peace Psychology in American Psychological Association, I was talking to uh, people that were in my generation, and I could see their attitudes were formed long ago, and they were rigid. And young people are able to uh, look at it more with fresh eyes uh, and, and not have that kind of buildup of, of the history you were talking about. What happened in the 80s doesn't matter as much to you if you were born in the 80s. Now, here's my case that a bigger downturn in the numbers is on the way. While those, uh, the number, uh, the rate has been going down, the repeats have been going up. So women who are having their second, third, fourth, fifth abortion. So they're keeping, they're, they're keeping the numbers up as high as they are. If, they, if every woman only had one, the, it would already be way down. But they're keeping the numbers up because they're having repeats. Now, the thing is, it, it could be, you know, for some women, they know that that was an awful experience, they're never doing that again. For some women, having had an abortion means, you know, as soon as you have the abortion, you have changed your status from a woman who hasn't had an abortion to a woman who has. But when you have the second abortion, you know, you already got that status, so it's not as much of a change. And it's also not as scary because it's a known thing. But, be aware, you have to have that first abortion before you can be a repeat. It is an airtight prerequisite. <laughs> Okay, so that means that if, if it's going down this way and this hunk of it is repeats, well that means the two, pool of people that are getting their first abortion is way lower mm -hmm. and you have to draw from that pool to get the repeats. You can't keep having repeats without having the first timers. So, and, and by and by, the repeaters will drop by attrition. I mean, some of them will get surgically sterilized. Some of them will become sterilized by the abortions. And some of them will simply hit. All of them will eventually hit menopause uh, as long as they uh, are alive. So when the repeaters drop by attrition, the plunge is going to be deeper. Okay, now here, here I go over uh, why the decline. Oh, uh, clinics are closing, they're dro clinics are dropping like flies. There used to be, at the height, there were like 2,000 freestanding abortion clinics. And a lot of abortions were done in doctor's offices and by hospitals. Nowadays, far more abortions are done in those freestanding clinics. And the number, I can't even remember now, but it's in the hundreds. It's well under 1,000. Across so, the whole United States. Across the whole United States. So you have, you have a drop in availability, both because it's uh, concentrated in freestanding clinics, and the freestanding clinics are closing right and left. I mean, there were, there were several closed uh, last year. There, there are very few new ones opening up. This is, uh, this is a major reason because, of course, you know, this is not uh, entirely a supply and demand thing. It's not that there's the demand and therefore the supply rises to meet it. What happens is that there's a supply and they draw women in and say, oh, my dear, you, you do want to have an abortion, don't you? And um, they get women talked into it that wouldn't be talked into it. In fact, there are studies that show that, uh, uh, that mere distance. You have people who live in a suburb of Atlanta have a higher abortion rate than people who live three hours outside of Atlanta. Well, traveling to Atlanta for three hours and back, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's still more convenient than going through an entire pregnancy. You know, and if you're bound and determined, a mere three-hour trip is, is not about to deter you. 
And of course, there are plenty of women who aren't deterred, but the numbers go down. So we, we do have evidence that the availability drives the, 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 uh, the, the, the supply, drives the demand. And if there's less supply, there's less demand. And there's, there's various other ways of, of backing that up, too. Can I just ask, um, are chemically induced abortions drug-induced abortions that one could, in a sense, do on your own at home, therefore miscarry at home, are they being practiced in the United States? Is that rising? Uh, I believe those are included in the Guttmacher statistics. And uh, because, you, you know, you don't just do it at home. You do get a doctor's prescription, and, the, and yeah. you're supposed to be being supervised. Right. And it, there was a, a, a thought a while back in the pro-life movement that we were deadly afraid that once these pills became available, what were we going to do then? The pills are not popular for darn good reason. Who wants to go home and have a miscarriage mm -hmm. and see the baby come out of the toilet? I mean, it really doesn't have it. The stigma remains, and that, of course, is uh, uh, clearly the uh, uh, pro-life movement's achievement. The uh, services to pregnant women have expanded. The uh, the Casey decision allowed informed consent parental involvement. And if you look in the book, The Peace Psychology Perspectives on Abortion, we go over <laughs> the details of what kind of impact that had. And what, what's interesting to me here is, I wrote that chapter and I said, you know, um, with one exception clearly labeled, I'm not going to use the people who favor these restrictions. I'm going to use studies from the people who are against them. And the studies from the people who are against them clearly show basically what happens is, um, now parental involvement, it, it, the studies do show that it actually doesn't matter whether it's uh, notification or consent. It makes no difference. But the parental involvement means that the abortion rate in the states that have that do that, so immediately after you, you've got a natural experiment going here because some states do it and others don't. Mm -hmm. And what's shown is that the abortion rate goes down among those under 18, but not those over 18, in those states that have it, but not in those states that don't. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, uh, one study looked at the suicide rate yeah. of young women in uh, under parental involvement and found that it went down at a time when it didn't go down among those over 18 or among the men of the same, the, the, uh, under the males. It went down under females. Uh, my, my hypothesis, of course, being that uh, if you have fewer abortions, you have fewer abortion-related suicides. We don't know that, but that's the, uh, an explanation. Do you think there is any threat of stigma going away? Because I feel like Planned Parenthood has had more shot your abortions, and I don't know if this has happened in other cities, but in D.C. where I'm from, there's like a, there's Carafem, which is like a spa abortion clinic, and it's like trying to be like, oh, it's just like getting a pedicure. Yes. So do you think that's kind of... This is, this is no different from what they have been doing for decades. And, I mean, they've all understood all along. The, the original Silent No More was supposed to be women getting up and giving their abortion stories to explain how wonderful abortion was, and the uh, uh, pro-life movement just appropriated that straight out because uh, what, what, what we found is that women who have become pro-life are way more likely to be able to tell their story in public. I remember one year... Uh, National Organization for Women and National Right to Life had their conventions at the same weekend in Denver. Wow. Um, I think now was doing that deliberately. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they knew when National Right to Life was there and they just deliberately did that. Uh, and there was some overlap on day, so I went to both. And at the National Right to Life Committee, you would have, uh, it would be a very common experience that women would say, well, when I had my abortion, and people would be giving her a sympathetic ear, and she was going to say something negative about it. And so I thought, okay, well, what's going to happen now is that, you know, the, the reverse. People give a sympathetic ear, and she'd be saying something positive about it. What actually happened is that nobody ever brought up their abortion at all. 
ever. It was fascinating. You know there had to be women who had had abortions there, and there was certainly plenty of abortion-defending rhetoric, mm -hmm. but nobody, nobody referred to their own personal experience. Mitchell, yeah. so you have the national statistics. How, how does that drill down to the state level, to the community level? Like, could I find out in my county what the rates are? I think if you, what you do is dig into the Alan Guttmacher Institute uh, website, and I, uh, uh, I, I'm pretty sure they at least have it down by state. They might have it down by county. I'm, uh, I don't recall seeing that because I hadn't been particularly interested. But I, I, I'm uh, at least by state it would be. You can also check the state health department or the county health department. Yeah, a they lot of times. Keep their, they may or may not keep their own statistics. Right, right. Okay, I talked about the little sister effect mm -hmm. and then, of course, uh, our own educational efforts. Okay, now, here's the great switch. From the 1990s to the 2000s, we Americans are a noble and virtuous people. Abortion numbers rate and ratio are all going down. From the 1990s on, on to now. Okay, got that? We're noble and virtuous people. Everything's going down. Abortion numbers, rate, ratio, number of abortion doctors, number of abortion clinics, all zipping down. Well, of course they are. Notice the two nail match. They're no longer dissonant. They're no longer a mismatch. In fact, to the contrary, this one bolsters the case for this one. And uh, the late Robert Casey was, was uh, beautiful about this in his rhetoric. He would say, he would say, well, of course uh, abortion can't last in a country as good as America. Of course it's going to fall to pieces, you know. He would, he would say this, and I was just sitting there going, oh, yes, yes, you've got it just right, okay? Now, what does this mean? This means that when you're interviewing, and I have, I have seen this myself, when I do interviews, I will make a point of saying this first before saying what's wrong with abortion, saying anything about why I'm against abortion, First point is, hey, do you realize it's it's the, the abortion business is falling apart? And and if they want, and sometimes they're interested, and then I explain it a little more out the way I've done. Then then we've got this settled, and according to the theory of cognitive dissonance, they're gonna want to know why. Okay? Well, as soon as they want to know why. Then you can go into all what's wrong with abortion. Well, of course, of course this is going to be happening because this is true. I mean, even if you don't quite believe this is true, this is always going to be the background of, of people's minds. And you need to be aware of that. So all kinds of times when a reporter started out relatively hostile, I start out with this point, and I have myself a really good interview. That's what I just said. The theory of cognitive dissonance predicts that once people realize the facts have changed, they'll want to account for it. That helps to establish cognitive consistency, and we have plenty of reasons to offer. I mean, whatever it is they're interested in, you know, pull out of the bag. There are, there are plenty of reasons. And as I said, this works on abortion, this works on executions, this works on nuclear weapons, this works on uh, war in general. In all cases, all of these things are going down. And so what you've done when you start out by saying so, you should start out with that fact, is that you've made it safe for people to hear whatever you're saying against them. If nuclear weapons are still being built and the stockpile is going up, then you try to say, isn't this terrible? We need to do something about it. And people are like, for one thing, you feel kind of helpless. But for another thing, it, it tackles that cognition of we Americans being a noble and virtuous people. And those cannot, 
you, you just can't have facts that are in contradiction to that. So when you have facts that are consistent with that, for heaven's sake, use them. So, when educating about abortion or death penalty or war or nuclear weapons, inform how the numbers are going down, explain why this is likely to continue, cast the arguments against abortion as reasons for this decline, and cast them to explain why listeners who oppose can go ahead, this is important, this is really important, cast them to explain why listeners can go ahead and oppose abortion now even if they didn't before. Oh gee, I didn't know the, that it caused breast cancer. Oh, I thought women were being uh, protected from the back alley butchers and now I find out that actually abortion clinics uh, have uh, terrible conditions that tend to have terrible conditions in them that it, it wasn't the back alley butchers that were the problem, it was the nature of abortion that was the problem. And even if you make it completely legal, well, we thought we were, you know, good hearted people that were going to get women away from the back alley butchers. And, you know, it's kind of uh, nerve wracking to realize that Roe v. Wade actually put some piece, in the case of Richard Musi in Kansas City, he had been put out of business. He uh, was, had opened up an antique shop on uh, Main Street, and Roe v. Wade passed, and he was put back in business. I mean, the whole reason he was put out of business is that he had killed a woman. And the jury gave him 10 years, and the, uh, they said the only reason it was 10 years was that that was the maximum they were allowed. They would have liked to have given more. They really had it in for him. Uh, in the horrific way he had killed this woman. Was this a uh, legal abortionist? It, this was when he was an illegal back alley butcher. Yeah. And so he was put in jail, but being a rich person, he got out early, but nevertheless, he was out of the abortion business until Roe v. Wade passed, and then he was put back in. And that was the case that convinced me, because I had been all worked up about the back alley butchers. And when I realized that Roe actually put them back in business in, in this particular case, and that over the course of time that we've realized that making it legal did not make it safe for the woman, that, that we're still pulling women into places that, uh, you know, when you, you consider the Gosnell case, and I mean, that's, that's just one of the latest ones. There's just a long string of these. And so, um, so people can, they don't have to say, oh, I've been a rotten, stinking person because I used to support it. Now, obviously, anybody who uh, worked in an abortion clinic has got, to, um, has got to work through the, that, um, you know, they, they did something that they wish to uh, get out of. But for people who simply have an opinion, and then the opinion changes, you can give them, just be mindful of giving them reasons to change that don't indicate that they were rotten stinkers before, that, that they would have had the opinion before, that it is a reasonable thing to change. Okay, as I said, oh, uh, Infanticide, of course, uh, I mean, there was a start to, to getting infanticide going, and it's not, it's not that we're out of the woods entirely on that, but mainly people, mainly you can still make the argument that uh, what's wrong with abortion is that it's just prenatal infanticide, and people will say, uh, pe generally people won't say, well, but what's wrong with infanticide? I mean, there are some that will. There are some that will. I, I can name it. Peter Singer, obviously, is one. So all of the, the death penalty and euthanasia and infanticide, still there's a lot of work to do. We need to pay attention. But they are shadows of the carnage that they used to be. I mean, remember, death, uh, death penalty used to be just, uh, you know, just incredibly common, and they used to do it for pickpockets and all that. Psychology says, keep pointing out. These are shadows of what they used to be. Because you want to build people up to say, 
you know, instead of saying, ooh, we're violent, isn't this terrible? We should be saying, ooh, look how less violent we're becoming. Doesn't that show what good people we are? Now, here's the waning of war. This is the chart I was talking about. War deaths are going down. Um, I mean, now, obviously, you have a, uh, you would expect there to be a biggie in the 1940s, what with World War II. And you have uh, this here. But here, look at this. The trend, I mean, obviously, you have ups and downs. Um, the difference between yellow and blue and brown is, the, uh, I believe, the difference between like civil wars and wars between countries and that kind of thing. And I don't remember which is which. We are getting mu much more, uh, the trend is towards civil wars. Yeah? Worldwide, these statistics? These are worldwide, yes. Oh, they have to be worldwide. Yeah. If it was just the U.S., that'd be kind of useless. Isn't and it? even there, uh, a lot of the deaths in World War II, if you can imagine, the rate is not as high as it was during the Middle Ages. Isn't that due to better health care? World War II was the first war where there were more battle deaths than disease deaths. So, yes, a, a, a lot of that is, is that simple. But also a lot of it is... Um, the survivability. And a lot of it is survivability of injury. Absolutely. Uh, an awful lot of uh, uh, injuries that would have killed somebody in Vietnam did not kill somebody in Afghanistan. So, uh, so, that, so there, that is true that you, you can have the exact same thing going on, but the, the disease didn't happen and the medical care was better. Nevertheless, war deaths are going down. The point of saying so is that people have such a sense that war is, people are, there are a lot of people that just have this juggernaut feeling about it. That's, that's the end of my presentation, and we haven't left as much time for questions as we ought to have been here. Well, that's partly because, of course, the questions came in the middle of the presentation, so, but do we have more? Um, seems to me that abortion and rights people who are consistent uh, use two related arguments. Uh, the first is that something of the variation that the uh, fetus takes its meaning from the woman in whose body the pregnancy unfolds. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, basically, you know, um, I'm, I'm not an expert at this, but, but postmodernism, mm -hmm. that there's no objective uh, reality yeah. or situational ethics or whatever you want to call it, okay. that if you believe it's a person, it's a person, and if you believe it's uh, just tissue, it's just tissue, and there's no uh, mm -hmm. objective reality, everything's a matter of perception. And uh, the related uh, belief is that a, a fetus doesn't become a person until it has a sense of, of self. Mm -hmm. In other words, when its life is of value to it, mm -hmm. that's when abortion becomes wrong. And uh, they believe that a baby uh, understands that it's a separate entity somewhere between the fourth and fifth month after birth. Yeah. When it understands that, that it's actually an independent actor, uh, in mm -hmm. he or she understands it's an, it's an independent actor in the world. And that's when uh, abortion becomes wrong when the uh, baby's life becomes a value to itself. Mm -hmm. um, I remember um, a book, I don't know if you, you know it, uh, um, Feminist Voices, Fetal Subjects, or Fetal Subjects, Feminist Voices, which was an academic anthology of a woman who wanted to beat the uh, uh, pro-lifers at their own game. Let's, let's, uh, uh, discuss the value of abortion rights from the perspective of the fetus. Mm -hmm. And I think she wanted people to use like an every child, a want a child approach, that a child might be better off uh, mm -hmm. dead if uh, the quality of life wasn't high enough, or possibly to use uh, the argument that I just mentioned, that if the child's life wasn't a value to it, then uh, why should it be of value to us? You know, kind of a, a, mm -hmm. a, 
uh, there's no objective reality approach. Uh, but to her surprise, uh, the authors used, well, one person said, well, sometimes you just have to make hard choices. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that, uh, that a, a grown man's life is of more value than a fetal life. Mm -hmm. um, but the other essays basically said uh, that this argument, um, these arguments are irrelevant. The fetus is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And they didn't even seem to give a reason why the fetus should be irrelevant. It was mm -hmm. just... Mm -hmm. To to uh, I, I I guess it seemed to me to deal with their cognitive dissonance. This is an irrelevant argument, and we don't even I don't even exactly mm -hmm. that would be Could a common thing. Could you just comment on this cognitive dissonance from the point of view of pro choicers? Yeah, well, um, and how do they deal with cognitive the, dissonance? In some cases, they they have it reasoned out, and um, and. Whether that's uh, sound reasoning or not is, is a separate question in psychology. But in a lot of cases, they, they know that they're talking about killing someone and will say so. And the simple fact is that if all pro-choicers really were consistent about knowing that, that you know, this is just a piece of tissue kind of thing, I would, I would be less convinced. But it is because they very frequently come up with, you know, like one fellow said, well, a pregnancy is two people occupying the same space and I take the side of the woman. And I'm immediately like, well, if it's two people, their mother and child, why are we taking sides at all? Why aren't we taking the side of both of them? You know, um, I had one Planned Parenthood uh, a board member who said to me outright, well, yeah, it's a homicide, but it's a justifiable homicide. Mm -hmm. so, um, so we do have mental gymnastics going on in a lot of cases, but I, I think that deep down there's cognitive dissonance because they know better, but then, of course, they'll make the same accusation of me and... Um, you know, we don't we don't really get anywhere saying people deep down know better. Be, you yeah. have to have you have to have something better than that to refer to uh, there being a case of cognitive dissonance. But if you would like, uh, in in addition to the status of the fetus, there's the the health uh, uh, the health practices in the clinics and all that kind of thing. I have a lot of details that are clearly cognitive dissonance in my book on the achieving peace in the abortion war. I was. Oh, I'm sorry. I I was pointing uh, there. Yeah. Um, Rachel, uh, I'm from Canada. My name is Martha, and I just want to say I followed your work for years, and it's so nice to hear your presentation today. <laughs> Thank you. I wish some of the good news seemed to apply to Canada as much as it seems to, to the states. Oh, there you there you yeah. have it. Yeah. You should come and do some studying with us too. But mm -hmm. I, I wanted to say that I really was inspired by your saying give people in a sense a, a permission to um, safely change one's mind to say right. I didn't know that in exactly. a sense um, or in fact for example our book complications abortions impact on women mm -hmm. we're looking we're kind of presented as okay what are we all now able to learn from mm -hmm. 30 years of abortion practice worldwide mm -hmm. that we didn't know mm -hmm. and using that as kind of an entree to say, okay, let's see what's out there and let's all discover it together. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the, the research part that gives permission to people to say, well, yeah, maybe you couldn't have known this. Maybe we couldn't have. We had to look really hard for this stuff. Mm -hmm. Come look with us. Yes. Exactly. And then the back part of the book is, in fact, let's listen to women. And then we have about 100 narratives in there and say, Let, let's give them a chance to speak. So I look no more. Yes but in print and people who maybe didn't feel comfortable to speak and so put it together. Right. So I right. think you're validating that kind of approach if it can be, be heard that we tried to do it in this book. And lots right. and lots of our stuff comes from the States. And, and, and exactly. But exactly. we did find that the easiest places to get objective qualifications about or, or revelations about negative impact on women mm -hmm. were studies that were not North American, mm -hmm. that were European, New 
Israeli, uh, all over the world, but not necessarily North American because of the political agenda, the, the, almost the mask that you got to keep up. And other places maybe didn't have as much political um, money placed on well, things the, under the American Psychological Association Task Force on Mental Health and Abortion. Uh, was a stack deck to start with, and I immediately objected. I mean, there had been no call for nominations. I would have, I would have volunteered for it, um, and I was told, "Well, don't worry about it because it's going to be the the science and not the politics." I got one look at the first draft because I was a reviewer. They did take me on as a reviewer. It literally made me sick. I had to go take a walk in order to get it out of me. They 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 totally did not get what their bias was. I spent a good 30 or 40 hours going line by line explaining to them very carefully what, where the problems were. And when I saw the second edition, which did not go out for review, the revised uh, edition, it was very clear that my task was to let them know which arguments were not going to fly. And so they dropped them. Huh. They didn't say, oh, well, here's one way of looking at it, but then here's another way of looking at it. They simply dropped them. So, Evelyn, you well, have mine was just a question on number one. It was a statement on number one that we are noble and good. Yeah. But is that does it work within the African American community? Well, and there, there you have a, there you have a point. Um, and there, there are pockets in, in the United States where that's not the primary cognition. But then uh, we African Americans are a noble and virtuous people. Well, whatever cognition it is that they actually have, whatever it is that's in yeah. their mind, that's yeah. what, yeah. I mean, because I was never making this as a statement that I believe in. No, okay. I was making this as a statement of what they're thinking. Okay. And the thing is, uh, we're not interested in trying to convince them that it isn't so. We're try interested in trying to convince them to match uh -huh. Uh, what what the facts that we do know that will match that is just saying as soon as we match that we're going to have an easier time convincing. It sounds like an argument for consistency. It does. <laughs> well, that's also just in dealing with racism kind of stuff too. Mm -hmm. It's like if you if the new immigrants to the United States don't see us as this virtuous noble country, exactly. why learn our language? And so you have to find out what is there. You know, yes, exactly. What is what is it that they're thinking? Now, now, see, um, when I'm saying you'll bring it up in an interview, I'm talking like a media interview that's going out to the whole city. So you're just talking about folks in general. Whereas if you know that you have a targeted audience that's going to think differently, then go with what they think. That's the whole point. Okay. So since you guys are data wonks, are you familiar with the Freakonomics? Um, yes, I yeah. am. So, so, and that's sort of saying there's a virtue to abortion because of the drop. It so is. Respond, I mean, oh, it is exceedingly. It is, and it is exceedingly poorly reasoned. Um, but they're they're basically making the downturn in abortions is that all the people who would have had abortions have already been aborted, basically. Uh, I mean that's that's another theory. Their um, their reasoning is not sound, and I go into some detail in that in some book or other. I can't remember which one right off. They also had this marvelous idea that you know if we if we just uh, had people sign up to pay Planned Parenthood for every pro-life protester that showed up, you know, like a walkathon, only different. They just thought that was great, and they presented it in a book as a great thing because what would happen is that pro-lifers would know that they were, by showing up to protest, they were raising money for Planned Parenthood, and this would, you know, cause them great consternation, and maybe they wouldn't protest. And in fact, look at that, it's laughing hard. Look, we're still Every, by money to be in this room. Right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Every single pro life protester that I brought this up with has thought it was funny. And, 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 and the Freakonomics guys, if they were doing science, would have known okay, let's consult with pro life people and see what they think about it. And they would have known that the overwhelming majority, if not every one of them, thinks it's funny. Tell me about the person who wanted to be funny. 
What? Oh, and there was there was one uh, uh, protester outside the Boulder Clinic of Warren Hearn who actually went uh, uh, after she had done her stint protesting went in to the clinic to make sure she was uh, counted for credit for the program. Just <laughs> because well, you know that's how we think. <laughs> it's like. Okay, I could save a life. I could save somebody's entire life. There could be 70 years from now, somebody uh, being a 70-year-old person who would otherwise have been killed today be and, and, and instead is alive because I'm here and I'm supposed to care that Planned Parenthood got a little more money from Planned Parenthood people, you know? But, yeah, that's... The Freakonomics guys, they have some interesting thoughts on other things, yeah, but they clearly... That more kids are killed by swimming pools than guns. Yeah. Okay, you had... I do, but I heard in one of my psychology classes that a good reason that um, a lot of crime went down is that the baby boomers grew up, and teens and 20-year-olds are much more likely to commit crimes and homicides than people in their 30s or 40s, so they're just less... Yes. That's one theory, but I think my theory of the, uh, the war in Viet Vietnam being over and the nuclear weapons going down is another plausible theory. And the thing is, this is the real world. There's no reason why they can't both be so. You know, and, and you know, you can do studies where you have an experimental group and a control group and you can tease things out, but when we're talking about historical trends, there's... You just have to have speculation, basically, and you can back it up with uh, other studies, perhaps. But, um, but certainly, I, I think it's pretty clear that that would be one reason. I think we're done. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Approach these things, and, and that doesn't mean we have to work on all of them at the same time.